Welcome to worship. We're so glad that you've joined us as we begin this season of Lent together. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, Those of you who live in the Colorado Springs area, you should have received a Lenten bag uh, this past week. We had uh, 73 volunteers go out on the coldest day of the year and deliver those Lenten bags. And inside those were Ashes for Ash Wednesday that we celebrated this past week. And then also a couple other items I want to bring your attention to. Uh, We had the Lenten self-denial envelopes. This is something we do every Lent where we give a dollar a day through the season of Lent and then give that money uh, over to an agency that supports those who who are more in need than ourselves. And so this year it's going to go to Lutheran Family Services Rocky Mountains and support their foster care. And I had a conversation with uh, Tim Zexer uh, more about that that we'll be sharing with you. Well, I'm here with uh, Tim Zexer from Lutheran Family Services, Rocky Mountains. He's the Advancement Director. Did I get that right? That's right. uh, But first of all, could you just tell me what is Lutheran Family Services, Rocky Mountains? Uh, We are a faith-based human services organization. We share the Lutheran name and heritage with you all, uh, and we believe that we are called to serve the vulnerable in our communities, no matter where people are from, no matter uh, who they are, no matter what stage of life they are in. uh, If they are part of our community here in Colorado Springs, we want to find a way to serve and care for them. We happen to do that in Colorado Springs uh, through adoption services, uh, both international and domestic adoptions, also foster to adopt. Uh, We also provide unique parental support for uh, our local families through our safe care program and through our great KPC respite center here in Colorado Springs uh, over on uh, Circle Drive. And um, we are one of the largest refugee resettlement agencies in the region, uh, providing housing and jobs and family stabilization for our refugee and asylum seekers who legally get placed uh, in in our care. we're going to do this collection and it'll go to foster care. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, how that money is used by LFS RM? 
Right now in our foster care program, there are a number of, of needs. Um, the first is, is to help recruit and train more foster families. Uh, sadly, because many of us are still relatively isolated and children are not in frequent contact with mandatory reporters, such as teachers and, and doctors, we know that there are, are more kids out there that need our services than are getting them. Also, as things open up, we want to let our kids be kids again. Um, we want to safely send them to camp. We want to um, get them in music lessons and in sports leagues and provide them with extra math tutoring or whatever they need. Um, these are really important tools for, for, child, uh, for childhood development. And um, many of these activities we can actually do and are doing right now virtually, but only if there is if there's funding to, to do these enrichment uh, activities. And then finally, you know, part of your gifts simply support our amazing foster care clinicians uh, and case managers. In the last 11 months during COVID, um, we've actually increased the the amount of contact we've had with our foster families not decreased. Um, we've utilized new ways to communicate with families, provide educational resources, offer support groups, um, visit homes, uh, do home studies safely. But this takes a lot of extra work, and and your generosity supports that. Well, we we love that you are giving us the opportunity to be part of that that ministry. I mean, that's why we support agencies like yours and others, just because we believe that's what God's called us to do, and we want to. Um, we want to join with you and those people who are on the front lines uh, helping kids and uh, especially kids who need uh, foster care families can't imagine what they're going through and how difficult that is and so if we can do anything to come alongside people we want to do that so uh, thanks for giving us the the chance to to do that and all the other work that LFSRM does I mean that's a it's a privilege for us to be partners with you also in the Lenten bag was the Adoration Journal. The Adoration Journal is part of our basic training. Uh, the B was for Bible. We did a, a seven-week series on going through the Bible. And then A is for Adoration. That's loving the Lord your God with all your heart. This is a journal prepared by the staff that's meant to help you in your prayer life, to help you draw closer to God. And so I encourage you to go through this uh, throughout the season of Lent. And then give us some feedback and let us know if it was helpful to you. We're going to be resuming outdoor worship services uh, next Sunday, and there's a sign up for that. If you'd like to join us, we'll have Holy Communion, and we'll preach the, the sermon live. It'll be the same sermon that'll be on these recorded uh, services, um, but I encourage you to come to that. And then also next Wednesday at uh, 12 p.m., we'll have our, our On the Brink uh, preaching series for those Wednesday afternoon services, and then also we'll have Wednesday night light at 7 p.m., and you can sign up for those as well. And that's all weather um, permitting. You know, if, the, if it dips below freezing, if, there, if it's snowing, then we'll be canceling that, and you can look on our Facebook page, or if you've signed up, we'll send you an email to let you know if we have to cancel. Today, we have a new adult seminar. Michaela will be teaching Created and Creating, and she says it's a class that's less about head stuff and more about heart stuff and letting your heart connect with God, doing a lot of a tactile things. They'll be doing a, a sand mandala today that was in those Lenten packets and as a way, a new way of praying. And they'll be creating a labyrinth and to encourage you to participate in that and find some new ways to connect with God. For our celebrations, we have two birthdays to celebrate. Larry Moe will celebrate his 91st birthday on February 23rd. Howard Dutzi will celebrate his 91st birthday on February 26th. For our anniversaries, Mark and Betty Anderson celebrate 50 years of marriage on February 27th. And Dave and Dorothy Selleck will celebrate 61 years of marriage on February 27th. Happy anniversary to you. We're also celebrating the 10th anniversary of the baptism of Emily Bell and Isabella Van Campen. So happy anniversary to all of you who baptized you 10 years ago. I think that's all of the announcements. Let's uh, continue with worship as we confess our sin. Hear the word of the Lord. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love 
and he relents from sending calamity. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sin. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy God, Heavenly Father, in the waters of the flood you saved the chosen, and in the wilderness of temptation you protected your Son from sin. Renew in us your gift of baptism. May your holy angels be with us, and the wicked foe may have no power over us, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today comes from Genesis, the ninth chapter. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth." God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning comes from from 1 Peter, the third chapter. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. 
He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight people, were saved through water. And baptism, which is prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Lent is all about recognizing the road to Jesus on the cross. In order to understand Jesus' really great sacrifice for us, we need to find ourselves responsible for the split between ourselves and God that Jesus reconciled on the cross. So I hope you journey with me this Lent through these beautiful stories, and you can also find them in our Lenten devotional for families on the youth page. But let's begin. Most of you know the creation story. But it's actually really important to our Ash Wednesday service. Lent always begins with Ash Wednesday, and we remember God's very first miracle, creation. In very good order, God separated dry land and water, sky and earth, heavenly lights in the sky, and then you have all of the living creatures, salmon swimming, hummingbirds humming, And even a rhinoceros showed up all at the right time. How did God even think up the beauty of a waterfall or the mystery of fog or the fact that bees can make something as sweet as honey? Where did he get the idea of thousand leg bugs or storks that stand on one leg for hours? How come he connected moons with tides and a little mustard seed could create a humongous tree? Then there were people. It was all a wondrous miracle. And on Ash Wednesday, we remember that God made the first man from the dust in the ground. When people go to church on Ash Wednesday, the pastor may put a cross of ashes on your forehead to help you remember that because of our sin, our earthly bodies will one day return to dust. Do you remember what that first sin was? Well, if you don't, I'm gonna remind you. The first sin. One of the animals that God created was very tricky, the serpent. The serpent was clever and sly and up to no good. Did God really say you can't eat the fruit from the trees in the garden? The serpent hissed softly to Eve. No, said Eve. God said we can eat from, eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden, except for the tree in the middle of the garden. God said not to eat from that one, not to even touch it. The serpent smiled a sneaky little smile. Ha, God doesn't want you to eat fruit from the tree because if you do, you'll know everything. You'll be just like God. The serpent hissed in his sly way. Eve looked at the tree in the middle. Hmm. That fruit sure looks good. So she ate some and she gave some to Adam too. As soon as they ate the fruit, everything changed. Adam and Eve became very embarrassed and shy. They sewed some leaves together, making some pretend clothes to try to cover up their bodies. They stood nervously behind some bushes. Then they heard God walking around in the garden. God called out to them, Yoo-hoo! Where are you? Adam and Eve hid. Hey, where did you go? Called God. Adam peeked out from behind some vines. He said, I heard you and I was afraid. Why were you afraid? Asked God. Well, I'm naked for one thing, said Adam, who was quite embarrassed. So I hid. I see, God replied. Who told you that you were naked? Adam said nothing. Did you eat fruit from the tree I told you not to eat from? Asked God. Eve gave it to me, Adam blurted out. The serpent made me, exclaimed Eve. He tricked me. God sighed. I told you not to eat from that tree. 
Because you have done what I told you not to do, life will be difficult for you now. You will have to leave this beautiful garden and work very hard to get the things you need. Now you will know what it is to be unhappy, and someday you will die. I made you from dust. When you die, you will become dust again. God made some real clothes for Adam and Eve and sent them out into the big world, and God was with them everywhere they went. Now, thankfully, that's not the end of the story. God told Adam and Eve and all of their many descendants that their role is still to take care of the world around us. It just might be more difficult now. So I hope you go out and explore the world this week. And if you're interested, the Lenten Journal, the Lenten Devotional, has these beautiful new activities that you could do. You could make some Rice Krispie worlds, or you could even plant a Lenten garden. I hope you explore the world around you and enjoy every bit of it, because God created it with us in mind. Now let us pray. Lord, you made our world, you made me, and put me in it. Help me to be a good citizen of the world. Help me remember every minute that I am your child, one of your miracles. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And the voice came from the heavens, you are my son, you are the beloved, and with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days and tempted by Satan. And with the wild beast and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe in the good news. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Mark's gospel moves fast, as we'll see this year. In six verses, Jesus is baptized, tempted in the wilderness, returns and begins his preaching ministry. Mark isn't interested in using many words for the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He wants to get to the cross. He wants to get to what's most important. But these early stories reveal to us who Jesus is, what baptism is, and what the message Jesus preached is all about. In Mark's gospel, much of the meaning is found not necessarily in the actions or the, the many words that he uses, but in the location where Jesus is found. We need to pay as much attention as to where things happen as to what happens when we read Mark. So let's start with the baptism, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River. This river, the Jordan River, has a history before John started using it as his base for operations. The Jordan River was the one that watered the promised land that God gave to Abraham and his descendants. It represented a natural boundary and defense for the, the land of Canaan, for the nation of Israel. It was parted by God so that Israel could cross it over into the promised land when they returned after 400 years of slavery. King David and King Saul crossed the Jordan many times in battle. The prophet told Naaman to go wash in the Jordan River to be cleansed of his leprosy rather than wash in the mighty Tigris or the Euphrates. Prophets Elijah and Elisha had their own miraculous crossing of the Jordan right before Elijah was being taken into heaven by a chariot of fire. And then John the Baptist calls the people to come out from Jerusalem, to come back to the river of Jordan, to repent of their sins, to be baptized, to show that they were turning away and were preparing their hearts to receive the Messiah. So this river, the Jordan River, represents new starts. It represents victory over enemies. It represents healing and reminds us of Israel's past, of the kings and the prophets. So when Jesus was wading into these waters, he was wading into Israel's history, identifying himself with all that had come before. Jesus had come to take Israel across a boundary, another boundary, not from the wilderness into the promised land, 
but from sin into forgiveness, from death into eternal life. When Jesus waded into the Jordan to be baptized by John, it says the heavens were torn open and God speaks from heaven claiming Jesus as his beloved son. God reveals Jesus as the way to eternal life. God speaks to Jesus, naming him as his son, expressing his pride in Jesus and the work Jesus would do. In that moment, Jesus changes baptism. No longer is it simply a marker of repentance, a way to publicly express your intent to change. But Jesus turns baptism into the very means of salvation, a gift to the church to unite people to Jesus and open heaven to us. At the end of Mark's gospel, Jesus will say, go into all the world and proclaim the good news to all of creation. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved. When the crowds ask Peter in the book of Acts what they must do to be saved after he preached about the resurrection of Jesus, do you remember what Peter said? He said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for your children and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And Peter would later write in 1 Peter 3 that, that baptism was prefigured by the story of Noah's ark, saying, and baptism which this prefigured now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul will build on that saying that in baptism, we are buried with Christ so that we might one day be raised just as he was raised. When Jesus entered the river Jordan, he gave the church the gift of baptism, our own river of water where heaven is torn open and God adopts us as his children. More than that, we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit in baptism, which Paul says in Ephesians is a pledge of our inheritance. The Holy Spirit works in our lives now, moving in mysterious ways, often leading us to places that we'd rather not go. In Jesus' case, it was the Holy Spirit that drove Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted and tested by the devil. Here again, we have another important location in Mark's gospel, the wilderness, the wild. Wilderness was on the other side of the Jordan, the other side of the promised land, a place of wandering, a place of searching. We hear those echoes of the 40 years that Israel wandered in the wilderness, waiting for God to deliver them to the promised land. In the wilderness, you are always on the move, never settled. You're always looking to where you're going to go, trying to get out. Wilderness is a place of danger where one learns to trust God, to rely on the Lord. I think of Elijah on the run from King Ahaz or, or David on the run from Saul. The wilderness is not home. It is a proving ground. It is a place that reveals who you are by stripping you of all your defenses you know, this pandemic that we're in, it is a wilderness, a time of life in our world where we find out who we really are, what our values are, what we care about. When everything is stripped away, when we are uncomfortable and vulnerable, we discover what we really are about. Do we worship God even when it's inconvenient? Do we care about the most vulnerable in our society, the elderly, the feeble? Are we willing to sacrifice for others, to put the needs of others ahead of our own? These are the ways we're being tested in this wilderness. And Jesus was tested too in his wilderness, tested to misuse his powers, tested on his values, tested to rely on someone other than God. In baptism, we are joined to God's family, adopted as children. In the wilderness, we are tried to find out if we will live as God's children or if we will give in to the ways of the world. As we enter into the season of Lent now, we enter into another 40 days of testing, 40 days of trial. 
And we do this intentionally every year as a time of faith strengthening. Our three dis- disciplines, fasting, praying, giving, are exercises. They are faith exercises meant to help us get stronger in these areas that we might more fully rely on God. I hope you will fast from something. Although in this year when we've lost so much, maybe fast from a little thing. We've had to give up so much already. I hope you'll dedicate yourself to prayer. And I hope you'll give sacrificially to a cause greater than yourself, to to someone in need. Here at First Lutheran, we've developed a prayer journal for Lent called the Adoration Journal to teach us how to, to dive deep in prayer and to connect with God with our hearts We're also giving sacrificially in our Lenten denial. We'll be giving at least a dollar a day to support foster care here in Colorado Springs. Support those those children who, for whatever reason, can't be in their own homes. And they need supportive families to open their home to them so they can come and be safe as they walk through a different kind of wilderness. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness confirming his faithfulness to God. And then after that time, he was sent to another significant place. Mark says he started his ministry in Galilee, proclaiming the good news, urging people to repent and believe. Why Galilee? What is the significance of that place? Its significance, I think, comes really from its insignificance. Scholar Chad Myers in his commentary, Binding the Strong Man, talks about Jesus in Mark's gospel as someone who speaks from the periphery. Jesus is not part of the empire, the Roman empire, the Roman expanse that had taken over and occupied Israel at the time. Jesus doesn't go to Rome to begin his ministry and start preaching there from the center of power. Nor is Jesus part of the religious empire, centered in Jerusalem, where all the priests and the Pharisees exercise their power and influence. Jesus speaks to these centers of the world, to Jerusalem and Rome, from the periphery, from the outside, from Galilee. And they're not going to like that. The powers that be do not like individuals commenting on their privilege. It would be like someone claiming to be doing significant work for the state of Colorado from, not to offend anybody, but like Pueblo or something. Not in Colorado Springs with the military bases and the center of military might. Not in Denver where the political powers are centered and the capital, but from some outside place. Jesus starts in Galilee, a town north of Jerusalem. A mixed town of Jews and Gentiles, an area of small villages and cities around a lake where fishing was the main industry. That's significant because it tells us a lot about who Jesus is. It tells us about God's character. God is for the outsider, for the people on the edges, for the people who are far away from power or sway. While the rest of the world is organizing their lives to climb those ladders, to get to the top, to get to the center, God leaves the big for the small. Jesus leaves heaven for Galilee, which is good news for us. Because wherever we are, God is willing to come to us. That's what we mean when we say we are saved by God's grace. Fundamentally, it means God comes to us where we are. God is willing to come wherever we are to find us lost, to find us broken, to find us sinners. When we are on the edges, when we are on the outside looking in, when we feel we can't make any progress towards anything, God comes to us and offers us salvation. He doesn't offer us salvation in exchange for anything. This isn't a deal. This isn't a trade. This is a free gift God comes to rescue us from the margins, not asking for us to do X, Y, or Z, but simply seeing that we are in need, finding us wherever we are, and offering us hope and home and salvation. 
Jesus goes to Galilee, to the small towns around it. And then he goes even further on the outskirts to the lepers and the Samaritans, the tax collectors and the prostitutes. And he goes to them wherever they are and he says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Can you feel the relief of that good news? The time is fulfilled. I think of all the anecdotes of people going to receive vaccines and you know, they, they find out their, their number's up, that they can, they're old enough to receive the vaccine and make an appointment and find there's a slot available and, and then they show up and they get the shot in the arm and you ask them, how was it? And there's this sense of relief. I'm not gonna die of COVID. You know, there's this pent up stress that we're all feeling and then you get the vaccine and I'm not gonna die of that. It's a free gift, a free gift of the United States of America to her citizens, a free gift to be received with thanksgiving and appreciation. We have received a free gift from God, the gift of salvation through our baptism into Christ. We will not die from sin. We will be saved because God left heaven to come to where we are. Do you feel the relief? The time is fulfilled. God has come to us. But this gift isn't for us alone. We are now sent out to join Jesus, to go to the outskirts, to the margins, to the people on the edge, and offer all this good news of hope. You know, our path as Christians follows Jesus' path, baptized and claimed as God's children, tested in the wilderness, and then sent out to the margins to the edges, to proclaim the good news. Jesus found us where we were. And there are other people who don't yet know the good news, don't yet know the time has fulfilled, don't yet know Jesus. Let's go with Jesus, find them, and proclaim to them the good news. Amen.
let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Lord of all life, when we cannot see the beauty of your creation, open our eyes that all living things thrive and grow. Let us pray. When we neglect the poor, the sick, and the grieving, open our hands to do your work in the world. Let us pray. When we ignore the cries of injustice in our midst, open our ears that all will know your love. Let us pray. When we are hardened against our neighbor, open our hearts and heal our resentment. Let us pray. When we are closed to the grace you long to give us, open our lives and turn us to follow the way of the cross. Let us pray. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.